want to get into this morning our study back in Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And this is probably one of my favorite sections uh, in Ephesians chapter 3. It's the end of the chapter. It's the end of a section, actually. For those of you that aren't aware of it, the Apostle Paul was used by God to write a lot of the New Testament scriptures. Inspired by his spirit, he wrote these in the form of letters to various groups of people scattered throughout the Roman Empire during the first century. And one of the typical patterns that he observes in all of his letters, all of his writings, is in the first part, about the first half of his letter, or his writing, he devotes to an explanation of all that God has done for us we couldn't do for ourselves. Sometimes we call that the milk of the word, like Peter referred to it as. The milk of the word is simply what the Bible has to say, what God reveals that he's done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And Peter, of course, admonishes us with that, using that metaphor of milk, he says, like newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow, that you can grow up. And so Paul gives us the milk of the word in each one of his letters in the first half. And that's what we've been studying here in Ephesians, the first half of Ephesians. We've been studying the milk of the word. What God has done for us, we couldn't do for ourselves. And it's good news. I mean, he starts out back there in chapter 1 with, Spiritual blessings we are blessed with. All spiritual blessings. And I mean, he just keeps on going on. He tells us we've been made alive or quickened together with Christ. We've been exalted with him, far above all principality and power. We've been seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus already. Our destiny is sealed. He goes on to tell us it all happened by God's grace. That is God's power working in us and for us. Not by any effort on our part, but by His grace. And so He reveals a tremendous amount of the gospel and He finishes up in this revelation of the milk of the Word by telling us that He describes it in one term that may seem a little strange, but He says, This is the mystery of Christ. Now, by mystery, He's talking as we've studied the last couple of weeks, he's not talking about something you can't understand. Okay, That's not what he means by using the term mystery. The term mystery is used by Paul in this context means something that had not been revealed before. Before Paul and the other apostles revealed it, before Jesus came on the scene and lived it, those folks living from Adam up to Christ, they did not have a complete, full understanding and picture of this mystery. And what the mystery really is, he calls it the mystery of Christ, it really summarizes everything God had planned from eternity past, from the very beginning, before he ever created the universe. Everything God had planned to do for us, we couldn't do for ourselves, in making us a brand new creation and creating for himself a brand new race of human beings. This is what Paul calls the mystery of Christ unveiled. And he's begun to unveil it for us here in the good news. Now having done that, and we're not going to take the time here this morning obviously to go back through all the details of that. It would take far too long to review it adequately. So what we're going to do this morning is to focus in on his closing statement concerning this mystery. And it's really contained in a prayer that he's written. A prayer that each one of us may 
ourselves receive and enjoy. It's a prayer that I've always been impressed with, like I've always been impressed with the Apostle Paul and actually sought to my, uh, pattern my own ministry after his ministry because it was his job to reveal this mystery. It was his calling to make known this mystery of Christ to everyone and to give them the, sh the fellowship, the sharing of this mystery so that they could experience the benefits of it personally. I've identified with Paul in that regard. And so here at the close of this particular section in Ephesians, he gives us a prayer. And that prayer is filled with all kinds of glorious statements that I want us to consider. I'm not sure that we'll get through the entire prayer here today in our study because there's so much in it, but I want you to at least have an overview of it so you can read it, so you can look at it, so you can be encouraged by it. This is Paul praying, not just for the Ephesian people that he wrote this letter to originally, but praying for all of us as well, anyone who would read it. So if you want to listen to it, follow along. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, he says this. <clears throat> For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's quite a prayer, isn't it? That's an amazing prayer. And I want you to see what he's praying for and why. See, he's revealed to us up to this point, this what we call the mystery, a marvelous thing that God reveals through his word, not just here but elsewhere, a marvelous statement of truth that's really hard for us to understand. So those of you who have been following along in the study with me, if you found yourself a little bit confused and a little bit, a little hard to understand what it is we're talking about here, you're in good company, okay? Because this is a hard thing to understand. It's a hard thing for us to realize when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news of what God has done for us in Christ, it's not the simple message that it's been watered down to be here in modern Christianity. That simple message is watered down to something like this. If you trust Jesus, you might not have to go to hell if you behave yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but that ain't good news. I don't consider that to be good news because I never have been able to behave myself. Have you? No, you haven't. I can prove you haven't by just simply using the law. All I'd have to do is start with the first of the Ten Commandments, read them, and never mind the over 1,000 commandments of the New Testament. Inside of five or ten minutes, I could have you so guilty that you would jump through any kind of religious hoop I wanted you to jump through just to get some relief. Unfortunately, that's modern Christianity today. But that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the good news of what God has done for you that you couldn't do for yourself. It's a religious perversion of the good news. But unfortunately, that's all people, most people know. That's all they've heard. So when we really study the gospel of Jesus Christ and we begin to really understand what he says, what God says 
he's done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves in Christ is hard for us to understand because we haven't been conditioned that way. We haven't been raised up that way. We haven't been trained that way. So if you find yourself struggling a little bit, don't be too hard on yourself. It's normal. But this gospel that we're talking about, that Paul has revealed to us in the first three chapters of Ephesians, all the things that God has done for us we couldn't do for ourselves, all the spiritual blessings he's blessed us with, it all centers around one fundamental fact that we find really hard to believe. And it centers around this. You are no longer the same person you've always thought you were. You're no longer that person. I don't care how you've thought of yourself, good, bad, or ugly. That's not the person you are anymore. The good news, the gospel, is that God in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross finished the work, all the work, everything necessary. In fact, you all know that when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. What was finished? Everything necessary to make you a radically different person than you thought you are or were. Now that's hard for us to accept. Because all our lives, ever since we were born into this world, we have begun to develop, to develop a self-image or a self-concept. We begun to see ourselves and identify ourselves in the natural means by the experiences we've had by the opinion of other people, by our own performance, and by our comparison of ourselves with each other. That's normally how you develop that self-image. Now, whether that self-image is good, bad, or ugly, doesn't matter. That's not what I'm, up, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that, that self-image that you've had your whole life about who you thought you were is no longer the person that you are. God has already done something so radical. He has made you a brand new person. And the work's done. It was done on the cross. He has made you a brand new person. You see, what's so hard to believe about that is we can't accept the fact that it's already a done deal, okay? Because most of us, as we were conditioned into our natural self-image, we got this idea, bought this lie, that somehow it's up to us to change ourselves. Now, if you're really honest about it, you'll realize that you have never been able to change yourself. And I know that frustrates us. When we're not able to change ourselves and behave ourselves, etc., that frustrates us. And so to take the edge off of our own frustration, we go about to change other people, like people we marry, people we raise up, people we work with. You see, as long as we can focus on changing other people, and making them behave, it kind of takes the heat off us for not changing. Fact is, you've never been able to change yourself or anybody else. The only one that can change anybody is God. And he does so through his power, through his spirit, in accordance with who he's made you to be already. You see, God began this change process a long time before you came to realize it was necessary. A long time. In fact, he began this change process before it was actually in reality necessary, before he even created the world. And so it's hard for us to grasp this gospel, this good news, to really understand it, much less apply it in our lives. Because it's so foreign to us, it's so backwards to what we normally think that we are responsible for changing ourselves 
that we don't even consider what God is supposed to do and what he says he's done. Well, what Paul has been telling us here all along in these first three chapters is what God has done for us we couldn't do for ourselves to change us and transform us into a brand new person. But he knows something. He knows he's got a calling to do that. He knows, and I share that calling with him, he knows he's called of God to make all men understand this mystery and to declare that good news, that gospel and its purity and its sincerity to everyone. I understand that. I understand that calling. But here's the problem. People have a heck of a time believing it. In fact, a lot of them just don't. They had a hard time believing it. And, furthermore, I can't convince them. See, Paul finally came to the understanding that he couldn't change anybody either. He couldn't convince anyone of the truth of the gospel. He tried. You can read about it in the historical account in, account in Acts when he was trying to persuade a king concerning the gospel. And man, he laid it out and he reasoned all the way through it. And the best he got from the king was uh, I'm almost persuaded. But I don't buy it. And I'm sure he got frustrated. I felt that frustration before because he wants so desperately for people to understand the good news. You know what an understanding of the good news will do in their lives? How radical the change is from the inside out the kind of impact it will have on their families and their personal relationships, the kind of motivational structure that will guide everything they say and do. You know the benefits of that, but you just can't make it happen. Hard as you try, talk as you might, you cannot make it happen in another human being. Only God can do that. And so the basis of this prayer that I just read to you, the reason for the prayer, the purpose of the prayer, is for God to do that miraculous work in us so that we understand and receive that gospel, that good news. That's what Paul's praying for here. See, it took a revelation from God, a direct personal revelation from God to you for you to understand who Jesus was and is. You didn't achieve that understanding through your own efforts, academic efforts, through your own personal study, through your own search, you receive that understanding of the identity of Jesus, that he is, in fact, the Son of God, that he is God. You receive that understanding by a direct revelation of God, just like Peter did. Remember when Jesus asked Peter when they were on that vacation up around Caesarea Philippi, they took a little break, and he asked all his disciples, he said, <coughs> excuse me, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do you think I am? And they gave him the polite responses that was out there among the general population, you know, you're like John the Baptist come back from the dead, or resurrected prophet like Isaiah or, or Jeremiah. He, then none of them said what religious folks thought about him at the time. That, it, that was he was a half-breed Samaritan that was demon-possessed. But finally, Peter cried out, You are the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus turned to him and said, Blessed are you, Simon. 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This isn't just a matter of logic, but my Father which is in heaven. See, in order for you to understand who Jesus is, it takes a personal revelation from God. Well, just like that personal revelation from God that's given to you, so you can understand who Jesus is, it also takes a personal revelation from God for you to understand who you are in Him. Thank you, Chickie. It takes an absolute personal revelation from God through His Spirit working in your heart and your mind to convince you of the truth of the heart of the Gospel. That you're no longer the same person you've always thought you were. I can't convince you of that. I can't persuade you of that. You can't convince yourself. The only one that can convince you of that is God. And that's what this prayer is about. He is involved in this prayer asking God to do a miracle. Asking God to convince you of who you really are. Asking God to reveal that mystery of Christ he's been talking about. Asking him to give you the understanding, the insight in who God has made you to be. So he starts out his prayer. He says, I bow my knees to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I thought that was a little strange way to start this prayer out because Jesus had given his disciples and all of us an example of how we ought to pray. And his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. He gave them the model prayer, what we typically refer to today as the Lord's Prayer. And it starts out, Our Father which art in heaven. But that's not how he started out here. He said, I bow my knees to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why didn't he start it out the other way? I was thinking about that and it came to me. That he's trying to direct our attention and focus our attention on something that's real important. Because what he's talking about when he talks about the gospel and us understanding that gospel, he wants to reveal to us, as God has all the way through the scripture, in the most intimate of terms, as you wouldn't be talking about our identity, he wants to talk to us in the intimate terms of a relationship between a father and son. That father-son, father-child relationship is how he begins his prayer. And he focuses our attention on the relationship that Jesus, as the Son of God, had with his Father in heaven. Now, it's important for us to realize that that relationship that Jesus had with the Father is exactly the same relationship this new person that you now are has with the Father. There ain't no difference. The relationship Jesus had with the Father is therefore the relationship you have with the Father. Now, I know this is foreign to a lot of people. 30 years of ministry, 30 plus years of ministry, I've, I've noted that people in their natural social comparison process in religious circles, they got the idea that certain people are more holy than others. Of course, all of us develop this attitude that says, I'm more holy than anybody else, right? We call it the holier than thou attitude you know what I'm talking about now I know none of you ever did that but <clears throat> people do it okay, all the time and so there are good Christians and bad Christians right there's a level and so there are people that are really close to God 
you know, like preachers, which I find hilarious. As opposed to those unwashed heathen out there that aren't close to God, right? And there's variation and levels in your status with God as his child. If you're a really good Christian, you're God's favorite kid. If you're kind of a poor Christian, you're like a red-headed stepchild. I understand that all of that is natural. I understand that that's kind of the natural way we've been conditioned to believe, and we just kind of carry it on over into our relationship with God. But that's not biblical. That's not the truth. The truth is, and he wants us to focus on this heart of the gospel, the good news, the truth is the relationship you now have with God as a father-child relationship is just like the relationship Jesus himself had with the Father. No different. None whatsoever. That means you're as close to God right now as you'll ever be. Right this minute. That's who God made you to be. Now, to help you understand this, I don't want you to be confused with the fact that even though you, that brand new person God has made you to be, quickened you together with Christ, etc., even though you are as close to God as you'll ever be, most of you don't act like it. And you know that. Unfortunately, Christians don't always act like who they are, do they? Even those Christians have been Christians a long time. Had a relationship with God a long time. Kind of like King David. A man after God's own heart. He was a king for 20 years. Ruling over Israel. Then, he lusted after Bathsheba. Committed adultery. Covered it up with perjury. And tried to hide with murder. David did that? Man after God's own? Yeah, David did that. He didn't act like who he was. And so, not acting like who you are confuses us. That's a whole different subject. But right now, we've got to realize who you are. Because unless you know who you are, you'll never act like it. So what we're focusing on now is that mystery of Christ. What we're focused in on now is the core of the gospel, of your identity. And Paul is praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because he's going to focus our attention on our relationship to God being exactly the same as Jesus' relationship to God. No different. So he goes on to tell us, The nature of his prayer to begin with is one of enabling or empowerment. He says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. What does that mean? The of whom refers back to the Lord Jesus Christ being named, and he's talking about a family now. Remember, he's talking about family relationships, father-son relationship, father-child relationship. He says the whole family, God's family, whether they're in heaven or still on earth, that whole family is named or identified in Christ. the Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime you see the word name in the Bible, like in the name of Jesus, it's not just talking about his literal name, Jesus. Like the angel told Mary, he'll call his name Jesus. Not just talking about name in that sense. 
it's referring to something far deeper than that. It's referring to identity. So that's how we identify each other. We name each other. So it's referring to the identity of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is every member of God's family in heaven and on earth is named after Jesus, is identified with Christ. Now I know the scripture says you've been given a new name that no man but Jesus knows. I understand that. And I don't know what that is. I haven't got a clue what your new name is that he's talking about. But I do know your last name. Your last name is Christ. Because you're one with him. See, that's the family name. The family name is a name we recognize the family by. All families are recognized, and all individual members of that family are recognized by that family name. And the family name for God's family is Christ. So the whole family in heaven and earth is named and identified in Christ. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff associated with that, but I want to get to this first all-important request. He says in verse 16 that he, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Well, that's quite a mouthful, that first request. What's he praying for? First of all, he's praying that God, our Heavenly Father, would strengthen us. Strengthen us with his power. See, this does not help us with our power, come along as our, and to help us. And I, unfortunately, I hear this happen all the time among folks when they say, well, you, you just try as hard as you can and God will help you. Now, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about strengthening you with his power. That means God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. God doing through you what you're not able to do. So this first request is for strength, to be strengthened by his power through his spirit. Now the one doing the strengthening, of course, is the Father, but the way he does that is through his spirit that lives inside that new person he's made you to be. And through his spirit living inside that new person, he gives you the strength. That new person he's made you to be is not called a new person here. Or a new man, but it's called the inner man. See, when he talks about the inner man, I pray that God would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. He's talking about that person you really are. That new person God has made you to be. He's talking about that new, brand new person that was raised up in Christ, that was quickened together with him, exalted with him, and is used by God through him. He's talking about the real you. That's what he means by the inner man. Now he calls it the inner man because nothing happened to the outward man here, right? When you were born of the Spirit, nothing changed outwardly. You still had the same body you were born with. But inwardly, there was a radical change. We're told elsewhere in Romans chapter 6 and also in Colossians that that inner person you were, that person you've always thought of yourself as being, that inner man, that person was radically changed by crucifixion with Christ. In other words, that's what God did on the cross. It wasn't just Jesus that died, but that inner person that you were that was worthless, that you were trying to make up for, that you were trying to improve, that you were trying to make look good, that inner person was crucified with Christ. He calls it there the old man. And he doesn't mean your daddy, and he doesn't mean your husband. 
He means that person you were naturally born into this world as was crucified with Christ, put to death once and for all, and buried with Christ so that a new person, a new inner man, could be raised up with Christ to take its place. So on the outside, you still look like the same person. You still got the same mannerisms, still got the same memories, you still got the same ideas, same beliefs, same assumptions, all that sort of thing that you had before. But on the inside, you're a brand new person, a brand new creation. What Paul is praying for in the very first request here is that brand new person you are would be strengthened with the power of God through his spirit. Strengthened. What do we need strength for? Well, let's get the idea in our minds that this brand new person you are, even though you're identical to Jesus. You have his righteousness given to you freely as a gift of God's grace. You have his mind, the mind of Christ. You have his spirit living inside that new person you are. And you have his calling to be Christ to others, to love others like he does. That new person you are still lives in the same old body that's got all the conditioning of who you used to be. So the very first thing we have to realize is we need power. We need strength. Even though we're a brand new person, as I said a moment ago, we don't act like it all the time. In fact, some of us don't act like it much of the time. Even though we're this brand new person in Christ, and we're identical with him, we act like we're a heathen. We are continually selfish and self-centered. Continually doubting and fearful. We don't act like we're a brand new person like Christ. It's a struggle. Why? Because we still live in that sin-cursed body that still has the presence of that old nature called the flesh. Now, we need strength. We need power. We need power to be like who we are. So picture it this way. You, that inner man, that new person you are, when you're born of the Spirit, you enter into God's family. That's how you get there. You're born from above. Like you told Nicodemus, you were born once, that ain't going to cut it. You need to be born again. When you're born again by the Spirit from above, you become this brand new person, the child of God that enters into God's family. You have been born into his family as a child of God. Same relationship Jesus had with the Father. However, you're born again into the family of God as an infant. Now just picture this. That little newborn baby that just got born into the world in the family, lying up there in those little cribs in the newborn nursery, what does that little baby know? Well, he's alive and God made him cute. But he ain't got a clue what's going on. He's ignorant. He don't know who his daddy is. He didn't know how he got here. He didn't know what he's supposed to do. He didn't know where he's going. He's ignorant. He needs someone to care for him. He needs protection. He needs nurturance. Why? He's a baby. Babies can't take care of themselves. Now when you're born into the family of God, you're born as a baby. That's why Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. You're born a baby. You're immature. 
just as ignorant as that newborn baby, just as helpless as that newborn baby. He can't take care of himself. He can't feed himself, clothe himself. He can't even change his dirty diapers. He needs someone to do it for him. Little babies in Christ are the same way. And so this strength that he's praying for, that you would be strengthened by might, by the power of God in the inner man, is really a prayer that you would develop and grow and have what's necessary for you to grow up and thrive, for you to sustain the life God has given you. That's the first thing he's praying for. Now, how does God do that? He says that you would be strengthened with might by his spirit. You see, here's a really, really glorious thing about the gospel. Not only has God made you a brand new person, it's just like Jesus, a child of God, with the same relationship to the Father Jesus had, not only has He made you that way, but He has also given you the Spirit of Christ. The same exact Spirit that came on Jesus at His baptism. That same exact Spirit that John the baptizer said, I saw him descend as a dove on him. That same spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted, that led him throughout his public ministry, that caused him to do and say the things he did and say, that same exact spirit is now living in you, the new person you are. I know a lot of times we make a mistake thinking that it's some other spirit. It's not. It's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. This is the case even with the little guys. When they are born of the Spirit, they don't get a baby Holy Spirit. They get the Spirit of God. Now, that same Spirit that was on Jesus, empowered him, led him, directed him, is now in you. Why? Why would God do that? Because you're a baby. You need somebody to take care of you. You need somebody to comfort you. You need somebody to teach you. You need somebody to protect you. You need somebody to remind you. You need somebody to guide you into all truth. God doesn't leave you as orphans just floundering around here. He puts the same spirit of his son into you to strengthen you so that you can grow in grace and knowledge. So this first re prayer request here is for the new you, the inner man, that you would be strengthened, that you would be cared for. But notice as he phases into this second part of the prayer, second request, notice what he's really describing this comfort and nurture, the strengthening of the Spirit as. In the next verse he says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints the dimensions of God's love. Now, I'm not going to have time to go through this completely with you today, but I want you to know this much. The strength that God gives you as his child, that new inward person you are, that strength always, always, always comes in the form of love. Always. So he says, he wants Christ to dwell in your hearts by faith. What does that mean? He wants Jesus living with you. See, I like to think of the family of God as God being the Father, the Holy Spirit is our mother, and that's the one we're born by, and Jesus is our big brother. And he wants Jesus to be at home with and live with you. He promised his disciples, he said, look, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
How does he do that? Through his spirit, the comforter. Whose job, by the way, it is to glorify Jesus or literally make him real to you. So you can hear his voice. Follow his leadership. See his example. Know his character. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now there's only one responsibility we have to this in light of this prayer. That's what I want to leave you with this morning. That Christ may dwell, live in your heart by faith. See, that is our responsibility. Human responsibility in response to what God says he's done in declaring to us the good news of the gospel. Our responsibility always comes down to one word. Always. I don't care what the issue is, your responsibility always comes back down to one thing and one thing only, and that is faith. Are you or are you not going to trust what God says? That's what it comes down to. He's telling you what he's done already to make you a brand new person. He's telling you what he's done for you, you couldn't do for yourself. So your choice is either to accept that by faith and rejoice in the fact that you're a new person created in Christ and learn about it or in a spirit of arrogance and pride say I don't need that stuff what I need is something else and just ignore it even though he's miraculously preserves the record for us. We don't need to read that. We can Google our information. We don't need to focus our attention on that. We need to learn how we're going to change ourselves and other people. Our response is just simply whether we're going to believe it or not. That's all. You want to accept it? You going to believe what God says is true about you? Or are you going to reject it? Now faith, we know, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's impossible for you to believe in something you've never heard about. And one of the most serious oppositions to the Gospel today is the religious nonsense of the churches that are more concerned with making you look like good Christians than they are teaching you who you are. And so, understandably, many, many people, though they be born of the Spirit, many Christians don't have a clue of who they are because they've never heard it. They've never heard someone tell them, you're no longer the same person you've always thought you were. They've never heard someone tell them, you are a brand new creation made alive together with Christ. Nobody ever bother to tell them that. Instead, they tell them what you need to do or not do as a Christian. You can't have faith in something you've never heard. But guess what? You guys have heard it. You've heard it. Now, you can choose whether you believe it or not. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. See, now it's up to you. Like I tell all my classes, you know, my job is just simply to tell you the truth as best I can. Tell you what God says he's done for you, you couldn't do for yourself. And when I'm done, I finish my job. That means I get in the truck, go to the house, and I can relax. I'm done. And I feel good about that because I was able to do my job. However, your job just started. And your job is to want to believe what God says is true. That's it. Your job is faith. Will I believe what he says is true or not? I don't even say believe as being your job. I say want to believe. 
Because even that faith comes from God. So what he's asking us here, what he's praying for, is that Christ would be at home in our hearts. That we, like Paul, would realize, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ. My new identity in him lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That Christ may dwell in our hearts. That we would strengthen with his might, by his spirit, that Christ may dwell in our hearts so we can be rooted and grounded in love. Why God do this for us? Because he loves us. We're going to talk a lot more about that later. So let's close with a word, word of prayer, reiterating what Paul's prayed here. Fathers, we come into your presence. We thank you that you've given to us, each one of us, the opportunity for the same exact relationship that you had with your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we've, given, we've been given this privilege, the privilege to be in relationship with you as our Father, with your Spirit as our mother, with your Son as our older brother. We thank you that you brought us into your family. And we, like Paul, Father, we pray for that strengthening of the inner man. That you would cause us to come alive with an awareness and an understanding of who you've made us to be. That you give us that understanding, Father. And we ask, Father, that you would open the eyes of our hearts so we can apply that understanding to ourselves and receive the love you have for us. To know that we are rooted and grounded in you. To know we're okay. And Father, I thank you for this glorious truth of the gospel, for the mystery of Christ. I thank you for all that, what little we understand that you've already done for us. And I thank you for the opportunity for us to believe in it. I ask you now to help our unbelief. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.